Stanford in 1966. I gave some classes on floating point computation, including error analysis and a little bit about how it was done. And one of the students there was a graduate student, actually, Jean Golub's graduate student, uh, John Palmer. And he got his PhD there, but then went to work for Intel. And when they were developing the 8086, 8088, and the Intel 432, if I remember the number correctly, uh, they wanted to get floating point of these things. And uh, I guess Palmer persuaded them that perhaps it would be an idea for every box with Intel on the outside to have the same floating point on the inside. And he remembered the classes I'd given, and so he brought me in and uh, said he'd like to have a really nice floating point design. And he said, for a mass market, how big a mass market? He couldn't say. But he wanted me to understand that this was for a really, really big market. That's what they had in mind. So I had to think about what would work, not only for the specialist technicians, the numerical experts, but also for this mass market. And that is what induced me to design the 8087 arithmetic the way I did. Now, I had to do it with a stack because they didn't have opcodes in abundance. So the stack architecture was a little bit of a hindrance, but I got them to include the ability to reach down into the stack for an operand to combine it with the top. And uh, that made, made it a lot easier. Uh, I had lots of experience with that kind of stack and I knew that it, it would function well. Of course, nowadays, floating point is on chip with the main processor. In fact, you might even get one per, per um, core. core. Thank you. But at that time, the density of transistors made it seem miraculous that you could get the, the CPU on the chip at all. And so if you wanted floating point, that would have to be a separate computing engine. And you'd plug it into a socket near the CPU, and there would be conventions which would say, if you see an instruction of a certain kind, you'll know that uh, it's a floating point instruction instead of an ordinary instruction. And since the coprocessor and the main processor are both reading the same instruction stream, the coprocessor knows when it's time to execute one of its own instructions. However, the address computations have to be done by the main processor. Yes. And so the main processor has to squirt the final address over to the coprocessor. So there has to be enough wires between them. The 8086 itself apparently had 20,000 active transistors. And I understand you had 40,000 in the Well, there were 20,000 in the uh, ROM. Uh, and what's more, of those 20,000, the Israelis figured out how to pack two bits per transistor instead of just one by using very, very artful and delicate sense circuitry. <coughs> so um, they managed to get all the microcode in, not only for add, subtract, multiply, divide, square root, uh, assistance for decimal binary conversion, and uh, log, essentially, it was really log one plus, but log exponential, really exponential one minus, um, tan and arctan. And these kernels, as I call them, would make it easy for software to compute um, all the other transcendental functions, sine, cos, uh, hyperbolic functions, inverse, hyperbolic, in arc sine, arc cos, and so on. You could have a math library. And uh, there was a math library written by a friend of mine at Intel, uh, which was pretty good. Um, of course, some compiler writers insisted on using their own library, much to the detriment of, the detriment of uh, reliability and, and, repu and repeatability. But um, the library was going to serve the third floating point format, 
the 8087 chip ha could bring in operands that were integers or 4-byte floating point point numbers or 8-byte or 10-byte. And the stack operated on floating point numbers 10 bytes wide with 64 significant bits. This was more than floater double, but it was based on long-standing knowledge that you should have a scratch pad with extra digits so that for every operation that you would like to appear atomic, you can implement it in software in the scratch pad, round it back to the working precision, and out it goes, and it looks beautiful. What you're saying is that the chip would not only allow uh, enormous speed up compared to doing things in software, but also basically by building best practices into the hardware, it would make the software much simpler and Simpler and more accurate, yes. You could afford to use an algorithm that might lose uh, 8 bits, but that's okay. You've got 11 extra bits. <laughs> lose 8, who cares? Yes. When you finally deliver the result, it'll be a nice double precision result, correct, within a fraction of a unit in the last place. Yes. So you're not just designing a piece of hardware, you're also very much bearing in mind exactly how it would be programmed. Yes, and I insisted upon flags. That meant that if an exception occurred, either the hardware would not trap but give you a default result, but it would raise a flag. And so you could test the flag at your convenience. Maybe you know that this occurs only because the correct result would be 13 if you took limits. Okay, what I want you to do is to be able to pre-substitute and tell the system, in this block of code, if you encounter a 0 over 0, call it 13, or, or call it Q. We'll store the address of Q instead of the NAN, and when somebody gets a 0 over 0, it doesn't happen very often, then a trap will occur, it won't go to the operating system, it'll go to the math library. The math library will look into a table, oh, what does he want? Oh, he's given me this address. Okay, I'll fetch from that address and that's the result I'll give him. Right. Okay. So the advantage of that would be the operating system really is not going to know what to do with it, and the math library would. Exactly. Unless, of course, the programmer has made no provision, and it might be that he enables the traps, and the traps have nowhere to go but up into the operating system. Well, that's, that's bad. <laughs> but uh, programmers can do that anyway, and I can't stop them and won't. But now they have a better option. Also, the flag should ideally serve for retrospective diagnostics, and that means once the flag is raised, it should point by hashing to a place. Now, this would be maintained by the operating system, if it's requested, to a place in your program keyed to the source code so you know, in my source code at line so-and-so, this event occurred. Yes. Wow! That gives you an enormous advantage in trying to figure out what went wrong. Yes. Uh, and, and maybe it didn't go wrong. Maybe it's okay. But that says, you can look there and say, oh, is that what, he, what I did? Oh, that's okay. That'll work. Yes, that also would require the, well, I suppose the hardware, the math library, the operating system, the compiler, and yeah. the programmer all to work together in a particular kind yes, of that way. Yes, well, wouldn't it be nice if they collaborated? But you see, our programs are getting hideously complicated. Scientific and engineering computations have burst the bounds of the most insane ambition of 20 years ago. And so now they're so big and so complicated that we can't debug them.